Well, good morning, and uh, it's actually great to be back here. It's been less than a year, and you've made some amazing progress in a fairly short amount of time, which you should be congratulated for. Um, I also have to say that it, it really does feel like times are changing, uh, not only on your campus, but nationally. Um, there are, I don't think, any occasions that I can recall where I came to a campus and didn't have to say what Terry said in her introduction. Um, the fact that you're framing the work already in terms of its importance in mission, its importance in terms of faculty work, uh, the way that we generate knowledge and it has a democratic purpose to it, are all things which I find myself having to go to campuses and say over and over again. So I don't have to say any of that, which is great. It's really wonderful. Um, so what I do want to say this morning, and I'm going to try to do this in a way that we can have some conversation too, and we're in a fairly tight time frame, um, is to really congratulate you on your successes, and you have made a lot of successes, and to think about what it means to move beyond those successes. Um, and part of this is, uh, I have to tell you just sort of what I'm thinking about most recently. Um, in the context of how do we continue to advance this work. So what I want to talk about are the implications of being a community-engaged camp campus. It's great that we sort of have that identity, but so what are the implications of that? Really try to unpack that. So now that we have this Carnegie classification and, and actually a whole lot more with revised promotion and tenure guidelines, what's next? Um, and that's what I want to come back to, so we're going to sort of build this. Um, just to remind you, and, um, and you already heard it this morning, but the Carnegie classification lays out a definition of community engagement, uh, which you actually are enacting in many ways. Uh, and I just want to focus on a few things here. This notion of collaboration is really critical. A mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in a context of partnership and reciprocity. And I'm going to talk a lot about reciprocity. So I want to suggest to you that the classification itself suggests five propositions. And really what I want to do here is unpack the classification. You remember that it's framed out in four areas, uh, institutional commitment and uh, institutional culture. And then there were the two parts, if you could answer the questions on those, you could go on to curricular engagement and outreach and partnerships. So there's a framework for this, and that's the way Carnegie talks about it, is the documentation framework. So the five propositions, and we'll go through these one by one, engagement is achieved through institutional transformation. That's one of the implications of being an engaged campus. Engagement equals reciprocity, and we'll unpack that. Engagement as scholarly work is grounded in generating and disseminating knowledge. And again, you heard that in the introduction, this is deeply an epistemological question. And we need to deal with it as an epistemological question. Um, multiple pathways to engagement are reflected in institutional engagement. There's not one way of coming into engagement, but multiple ways. And when we do it institutionally, we engage all of those pathways. And then engagement reflects a democratic purpose. None of these things actually are said in the Carnegie framework. They're not said. They're embedded in it. So let's work through these. So proposition one, engagement is achieved through institutional transformation. I'll suggest to you that there's a model of institutional change which underlies the classification. Um, you're probably familiar with this work by Echo Hill and Green, uh, work that they did for ACE in the late 90s, looking at 26 institutions and how they were going about change initiatives. What they were interested in was the difference between change that was taking place and change that was actually transformative. So when they looked at their, their sample and looked at transformational change, they said they had four components to it. Um, and I want to just really think about these for a minute because I'm going to come back to them. So one is that it alters the culture of the institution. Change that alters the culture of the institution by changing select underlying assumptions and institutional behaviors, processes, and products. So artifacts of culture are things like promotion and tenure guidelines. So you could say when you begin to change those, you begin to shift the culture. It's deep and pervasive, affecting the whole institution. So it's not in pockets of the institution. It's not on the margins. 
and it's across the institution and it goes deep. It's intentional, right? It's part of the mission, it's part of the strategic plan, it's part of the leadership strategies, right? and it takes place over time. It doesn't take place quickly, it requires a long-term commitment. All of these are components of transformational change. So you're in this process now of committing to an identity around an engaged campus, but you're in it for the long haul. Uh, and it's going to take some time. There are going to be incremental changes along the way. So the model that they lay out then is this fairly uh, simple, but I think useful model. So you have depth and pervasiveness, right? and high and low. So you can have low depth and low pervasiveness, and they call that adjustment. So there's change taking place, but it's not going to go very deep or it's not going to go across the institution. You can have high depth and low pervasiveness. So you could have a department or a college that's doing really deep transformational work, but it doesn't affect the rest of the institution. Right? And then you can have your high pervasiveness and low depth. So it's going across the institution, but in very thin ways. Right? You can think of things like I've seen you know, uh, freshman year experience programs. Right? So it affects the institution, but it doesn't go very deep. And then you can have what they call transformational change, high depth, high pervasiveness. The model is useful because this is what Carnegie is aiming at with their classification. The classification is aiming for this quadrant. That's where they want campuses to be. So if we focus on the model, then transformational change requires major shifts in the institution's culture. And, and I want to keep sort of coming back to that. It, it's cultural changes that are key to understanding the classification. Programs are great. Right? Changes in courses are great. Um, all of those kinds of activities are important. But if we're really talking about institutional change and commitment, then we need to think about what does it mean to shift the culture. In this piece that Echo Hill and Green did, they looked at places where they, they thought, this is in the late 90s, there might be possibilities for transformational change. Not just change, but change that would really transform the institutions. One of those areas arose around connecting institutions to their communities. They saw this as having real potential for changing the culture of institutions. And again, if you think about how that is embedded into the Carnegie framework, you can understand how this model would really work. So quadrant four then represents <laughs> deep and pervasive change that transforms the institution. It goes to the innermost most core of the culture. So again, the, the Carnegie classification is aiming at is this fourth quadrant. A proposition that emerges from this framework, and also the literature that we have on community engagement, is that campuses that receive the classification are in either the third or fourth quadrant. And if they're in the third quadrant, they have evidence of moving towards the fourth quadrant. Again, remember this takes place over time. It's a, Slow, intentional process. Oops, sorry. I want this again. All right, so what this means, if you use the model, is that if you're in the first or second quadrant, you're not going to get the classification. Okay. Chances are you maybe didn't even apply or you couldn't get to the second part of the application. Those campuses that did get the classification are in the third or fourth quadrant. And if they were in the third quadrant, there was evidence that they were moving towards the fourth quadrant. So evidence might be there is a question in the there is a question in the framework which is about promotion and tenure guidelines. It asks, have you revised your promotion and tenure guidelines? How is engagement counted? In other words, is it counted as scholarship, teaching, service, or all of them? And then there's the third part of that, which asks, are there processes in place to revisit and revise your promotion and tenure guidelines? Are you moving right, towards this deeper cultural change? So the model is really useful as we think about sort of how to unpack both the classification and to think about change on our campus. Now areas of challenge that emerged in the classification process over 2006 and 2008 were in assessing community partner perception of institutional engagement.